next Sunday, there's going to be a little bit of a carryover, which I'll explain a little bit uh, in the sermon. Uh, in this Real Faith series, uh, R-E-E-L, Real Faith, and, and just looking at the mind of Hollywood and how it compares to the Christian faith and, and making sure that we understand what God is calling us to do. And so we're looking at this movie, Acrimony, today. Amen. And I want to use Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, uh, that I think is a parallel text uh, that kind of underscores what's going on in that movie. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13 says this, For my people have committed two evils or two sins. They have forsaken or abandoned me, the fountain of living waters, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can't hold, that can hold no water. And I want to talk about love has everything to do with it. And if Tina Turner was sitting there, I would say love has everything to do with it, Tina. Amen. It has everything to do with it. Amen. How many of you all saw the movie Acrimony? I just want to see your hands. Okay. Uh, how many of y'all, it was a little bit too much profanity for you. Let me, let me see. I apologize if I had, like, Pastor, that's a profane movie. But we, we live in a world where everything's profane. Amen. And we as Christians got to learn that the, sec the sacred has to come face to face with the secular. And so that's the, world, that's the world we live in. I don't know too much, almost on TV or in music or podcasts, that doesn't have some kind of profane in it. And so that's just the world we live in. Uh, but, but anybody willing to admit you've had a little bit of uh, acrimony in yourself, in a relationship, just a little bit. Maybe not as bad as Melinda, but just a little bit, just a little bit. Amen. All right. Okay. All righty. Uh, how many of you all believe that Tyler Perry unfairly caric uh, caricatures women or specifically black women? Let me see your hands on that. Got a few. Okay. Got a few. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sometimes I kind of think on this movie, he, he kind of maybe took it to an extreme. But, but understand, sometimes what movies will do, and you see it in scripture, they'll use a, a, a literary feature called hyperbole. Hyperbole is designed to exaggerate something to make a point. And so Jesus does it even in his preaching. He says, look, if your right eye offend you, cut it out. And for my literalists, my Bible literalists, you don't want to take that scripture literally. <laughs> it's hyperbole. There's one church father by the name of Origen. He took it, uh, he took it uh, literally, except he didn't pluck his eye out. You'll catch that on the way home. And after he castrated himself, he said, well, maybe he had something else in mind. So it's not meant to be taken literally. It's to raise a point. The exaggeration is designed to capture our attention, to raise a point. And here's the point that I'm drawing. Here's the point that I'm drawing. Here's what I think is real. When it comes to love, there's a serious problem between men and women. There's a problem. Say what you want. When it comes to love, and it comes to love relationships, there's a problem between men and women. I'm not blaming men. I'm not blaming women. But what we all can agree on, it's not smooth. And the truth is our kids are catching it because we can't get it together. Amen. We need to be honest about that. And I think that's what the movie raises. It, it raises that. And it really raises the question, is love working for us? Is the way we're loving this, this modern world, because now we live in this secular world that basically says we don't need God. God is not necessary. I can make it on my own. That's kind of the spirit of the age. And you got Christians kind of live like that. Give me a principle. Give me my breakthrough. But truthfully, I can do it on my own. And so we've adopted this secularized kind of love, but it's not working. And we, and we really want, need to ask ourselves the question, is this love working? This, this, this romanticized, this I'm in love, is it really working for us? And I think that's, that's something that the, the movie kind of raises for us. So let's look at some statistics, some good, some not so good. 41% of marriages in, in divorce today it has come down. It, at one time was at 50%, but that's... One every 36 seconds. 70% of marriages today are civil and not religious, uh, which means people are not seeing the need for faith uh, in marriage. And I, I actually think that's why it's not working. We're getting away from that. We're, we're putting it more into emotion rather than faith because you, you need the Lord to make it through a relationship. Amen. I wish I had an amen right there. You need Jesus, the blood, the anointing. You need all that. To make, come on, everything to make it through a relationship. Half of all women murdered were murdered by their partner. 
It's not working. That's all I'm saying. It's not working. Domestic violence is on the rise. 90% of domestic violence is against women, 10% against men. And, and there's, some, there's, some, there's some rough sisters out there. Say amen. Say amen. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. Don't get quiet on me. You know, it's some thuggish sisters will take you out. Come on now. 57% of men admitted to cheating. 54% of women admitted to cheating. That's about the only thing we agree on right there. Amen. Cohabitation rates are rising as fast amongst 35 and under and 50 and older. The rates actually are more amongst 50 and older. I say that because we make it seem like the younger folk are the only one doing it. The older folk are doing it as well. Amen. And so, the, the, and, and, and even in the cohabitation issue, it, it's, it's not even an issue trying to, to judge anybody. We know what the scriptures teach. We know what God wants. If we want it to be right, we, we're going to do it God's way. But there's a fear there that the cohabitation is rising because we're trying to test the waters before we jump into it. I understand it. But the issue is not testing the waters. You need the God who stirs the waters. That's the issue. <laughs> You can test the waters all you want, and it can be the right kind of water, but if God ain't in it, it's going to turn. Amen? 17% of marriages are interracial, and some of us have issue with that. You need to get over it. Say amen. Get over it. And it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. If God gives you love outside of your race, that's a good thing. Amen. 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 But now if you're doing it because you're avoiding a certain class of individuals in your race, I have an issue with that. Amen. I have a huge issue with that. Couples that share household chores have more sex. Amen. Let's clean the kitchen tonight, baby. <laughs> All right. Couples that make their, and this is not on the slide, couples that make their relationship Facebook official are more likely to break up. Tell your neighbor, don't do that. Don't do that. Use Instagram. Don't use Facebook. It's curse. <laughs> and here's all I'm raising. Is love working for us? And, and the truth is the younger generation are delaying marriage because there's a sense among them, amongst them they're skeptical whether it works or not. And, and the truth is, there, what, since 2015, there are more singles in our culture than ever before, and people are perfectly satisfied with being single. Some, some of y'all are perfectly satisfied, right? Amen. Amen. But tell the truth, if the right tall glass of water came your way, you quenching that thirst. Come on, you quit. I got one amen over here. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. I got one amen. All right. But you have to ask the question, is love really working for us? And, and that's what I want to look at today. Um, Jeremiah, in this text, he's preaching a sermon, and he's preaching to the people of God, and there are a lot of issues that they have. One of the issues is relationship. Amongst the many of issues they had, their relationships were not working. And, and God gives them this message, and basically the message is love has everything to do with it. God is feeling forsaken. God is feeling rejected because people are pouring their energies into everything else but him. And so he, he lays this word on Jeremiah's heart. He comes to church, preaches this message. Love has everything to do with it. God doesn't understand why my people are not loving me. And in the process of ditching God's love, they basically, uh, Jeremiah describes their love relationships as broken cisterns. So you may ask the question, well, what is a broken cistern? If I can put it on the screen for me, if you can get it on up there for me. Uh, this is one example. Some say this is what it is. It's kind of like a well, and that well was used to, to supply the water for the community. They didn't have running water as we do today. So everybody had like a community well, and that's where we went. So they're saying that, okay, maybe this was broken and the community suffered. I tend to think it's more the next slide. Uh, we would say it was kind of like an ancient water bottle. Th these are what they carried, these water pots, because it was a desert area, very dry area. So you didn't travel without a water pot. It was dangerous. Just, just like some of us, we keep a water bottle with us. In Texas, you almost have to do that in the summer. Amen? Well, that's, that's kind of how it was. And so uh, Jeremiah gets this word, and God gives him this image. He says it's just like carrying around leaky water bottles in the desert. Who does that? Nobody does that. And the point is, is that a leaky water, an uh, ancient uh, 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 cistern cannot fill. You, you wouldn't keep that. you throw it away and get a new one. 
And yet the people were pouring all their energies into their relationships, all their money, all their time, all their energy, all their passion. And it was leaking. They were getting nothing for it, no kind of satisfaction. And it wasn't working. And you would think that when they go through that, they would wake up and step back and ask the question, you know what, is love really working? And, and, and sometimes, y'all, I think that's kind of the culture. That there's the spirit in the culture that kind of suggests that, look, if I just get the right person, if I get the right relationship, if I just get that, that right situation, it'll be perfect. It's not true. And, and, and we may start out with great intentions, but over time we recognize we need something more. And we have to ask ourselves a question, is love really working for us? So I know y'all quiet because my mother used to say something like this. If the stone hits you and you're the only one in the crowd, maybe the stone was meant for you. Amen. You'll catch that on the way home. Amen. So what I want to do today, I want to look at uh, the movie Acrimony through the lens of, of this text to help us understand this problem between men and women. And hopefully we can come to some conclusions as to what God is saying to us. The first thing we got to be careful that I see in the movie and also in the text is that we got to beware of the magical lie. The magic of the lie or the magical lie. In other words, there's this lie out there, this, this, this love spell. It just casts a spell on us. And so even in the movie, you know, he would lie to her. And she knew he was lying. And she'd go back to him. That, that's just magical. And, and, and y'all can look at me strange. Sometimes you, you know something's not right. But it's like this, this need for love draws us into something that we know is not good for us. And so I say there's really two lies in this movie. Love is divine. And we almost, we almost uh, deify love. It, it becomes transcendent. And we almost make it seem like the love is our shepherd. Love will make a way out of no way. Love, love has everything to do with it. Love will fix it. And how many of y'all know love sometimes won't fix it? And, and, and we can know it's not right, but we won't step away. Well, I hope the Lord will just take. No, you got to step away sometimes because love is not divine. And that can go both ways. That can go for men. That can go for women. Our nose just get completely wide open and we can't step away and we see it stand in our face. Can't say amen. Just say ouch. Amen. The second line, you can have it all. Because Robert Gale, he has this great idea for a product, and he wants to make that money, but he thinks the American dream does not come with a price. So he thinks he can have it all. He, he kind of makes this promise to Melinda, look, I know it's rough right now, but when we get there, all our problems will be solved. We'll have all the money we want. You'll have the boat you want, the airplane you want. You'll have the high rise. You'll have everything you want. And the truth is, look, I'm not saying you ought not have success. God will bless you and all that good stuff. But the truth is, the more you chase the American dream, the more it comes with a price. I know entertainers and all these rich people post pictures of themselves, you know, jet setting it on the Riviera and everything's together. But you ought to see what their kids got to say about them behind closed door. And they loved ones. Everything is not what it appears. There is a cost, and, and, and many times kids get messed up, relationships get messed up, all kind of stuff get messed up, all in the name of trying to chase this American dream. And that's why I believe, look, I am not anti-success, but I decided a long time ago, I want God to bless me. I'd rather God bless me than to have America's success because the blessing will bless you financially, it'll bless you socially, it'll bless you in your family. Anybody know God will bless you? And you'll keep the money too? Come on now. Yeah, and so, and so we got to be careful of that. And you see that. And that's kind of what's going on in this text when Jeremiah is preaching. He says, the reason why your cisterns are broken, because you think there's something out there that's going to satisfy you. You think that there's something perfect, there's something pure that, was, that will quench the thirst in your heart. He says it in verse 11. Has a nation changed gods when they were not gods? But my people have changed their glory for which does not profit. You, you know you're not getting anything, but you think there's something out there. that There's no profit, there's no return, there's no dividend, there's no reward. And yet there's a part of us we keep pouring into stuff that reaps no benefit. It's like putting money in a broken vending machine that gives no treat, no candy. 
put money into it and everything and our energy, and then we go to God and ask why it's not working, because you're doing it the wrong way. It was never meant to work. God is the one that works, and it really raises the question for all of us, where do our expectations come? And we live in a culture where our expectations come from TV, our expectations come from movies, stars, uh, uh, quotes, or what have you, and the only expectations that will keep you sane are the ones that come from the Word of God. And so Paul was right. He says, look, you got to renew your mind. Be ye transformed with your thinking. Because many times, here's our frustration. Our frustration is not the person we're in relationship with. No, it's the expectation that we have of people. And so the frustration is the difference, and I'm going to deal with this next Sunday, is the difference from what I expect and what I experience. So I'm not, I'm not telling you to lower your standards, but what I'm saying is when you put unrealistic expectations on people and it doesn't happen and you see you do not get that fulfillment, you will experience stress and frustration. You will experience that unfulfilling feeling that we have. So just a few uh, expectation. So here, here I got the, for next Sunday, you can start working on it. We're going to raise this next Sunday and just kind of lay out some expectation, understand how the Lord works through that. And so ladies, what do you expect of men? What are your expectations? Men, what are your expectations of women? But then, then, but then we got to ask ourselves the question, what are our expectations of ourselves? See? Because here's the thing. We can have high expectations of somebody else and don't apply the same thing to us. See, that's the mistake. Jesus said, do unto others as you had them do unto you. And so many times, I can have some expectations of Lisa, but then God will ask me, okay, but do you do the same thing for yourself? So, so some of us have, have, have high standards, and it's good. You got high standards. And you say, okay, I need a man that's like President Obama. And that's okay, that's okay. Okay, the question God's going to ask you, okay, but do you have the characteristics of Michelle Obama? See, don't put expectations on somebody else that you ain't willing to, oh, y'all not getting this. Let's talk about some unrealistic expectations. Here's one. God's going to send someone to me that gets me. They understand my feelings, and they know how to make me happy. I, can we agree that's unrealistic? Can we agree on that? Okay. With time, the one I love will change because they love me. I just need to wait it out. Somebody shake your head. Would you just do this? Just, just go. Just turn all the way around. Just <laughs> Stop believing that lie. Tell your neighbor. My boo will never be tempted. No, what you talking about, Pastor? My boo, Jesus. I don't know what you talking about. He ain't that. He ain't that. Yeah, okay. All right, all right. Here it is. Being in relationship means my boo will sweep me off my feet every day and carry me across the threshold of the home and write me poetry and give me flowers every day. And it will just be a wonderful, wonderful romantic experience every single day. And I will have sex whenever I want to, how long I want to, because we'll just do it every single day, all day long. We'll never argue because we have a good relationship. Here's one. The person I love loves me so much they'll never hurt me. And, and I say that, y'all, because we go into these relationships, and the truth is we're all fallible. I've been married to Lisa for 30 years, and I've hurt her. I didn't mean to. And she's hurt me because we're, we're human beings, y'all. On your best day, you're going to hurt each other. That's why Jesus didn't say, find the perfect person. You got to learn to forgive. Preach, Altry. <laughs> he, 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 he didn't say you'd, you'd find the person that will never break your heart. You got to learn to reconcile and to repent. Because it's unrealistic to think that you can find the best person on the planet and we don't hurt each other. It's the nature of relationships. Amen. I will always be my boo's top priority. Mm. No, it doesn't always work that way. And so we got to understand, listen, there, there are lies out there, and we got to get God's word. We got to be realistic. It doesn't mean we don't, we don't want the best for our relationships, 
But sometimes our expectations can be so high, that's what creates, creates the, the uh, frustration. And it's not, they're not realistic. You ought to have realistic expectations. I mean, you know, a person ought to work. If you can walk and you got working limbs and, 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 and you can use your mouth, okay, six days shall you work. Not a sin. You ought to expect integrity in a relationship. Tell the truth. Be honest. I shouldn't have to put a tracker on your cell phone. Y'all not going to help me preach this sermon today, are you? You're not, you're not going to help me. Okay? And so we, 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 gotta, we, we should have some expectation. It's the unrealistic one. Let me keep moving. Number one, magical lie. Be aware of those magical lies. They'll, they'll tell you down. Number two, a misunderstanding or a misunderstood loneliness. What blows me away about the movie is that both characters, Melinda and, and Robert, were loners. They didn't have people to speak into their life. They clearly didn't go to church. They didn't have anyone to speak a word in their life. And many times we miss this. How do you deal with differences? How does God shape you individually? Because here's the thing. You can get into this issue. Your word against theirs. No, there needs to be a greater word, a greater word that governs the relationship, a greater vision. Because your word against their word, that's conflict. Who's going to break the tie? Well, I'm always right. Really? Are you sure you want to live that way? Okay. You'll be by yourself in time. So there has to be something that mediates that. There has to be something. Watch this. Because nobody wants to hear their spouse or their boo constantly telling them what's wrong with them. And I'm going to be honest with you. I'd rather hear from the Lord than from Lisa. And I love Lisa. But the last person I want to hear what's wrong with me is from my wife. Preach, fellas. Come on. Say amen, brothers. Are y'all hearing me? So, so the question becomes, do I have individuals in my life or am I in a place where I'm getting a word that helps to shape me? Because I hate to say it, I don't mean to be critical, but I mean it. But, but today's word in climate, Christian-wise, tends to be what we want to hear. Many times it's what I don't want to hear that helps me become a better person. And that doesn't mean the preacher should beat you up and all that kind of stuff. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the stuff that's going to help me be better with my communication. That's going to help me lean on God in prayer to be a little bit compassionate with my wife. The stuff that's going to develop me and make me a better person. Do I have those individuals that shape me and speak into my life? Because you can't get around this. Your childhood experiences, the negative experiences, the negative people, they shape you. They shape you. And the question becomes, who is in your life to counter those experiences? We are a product of our experiences. And so the way God set this thing up is the way church works and the spirit works, it's my experience with him and my experience with other people that help shape and change my life. And so when I, I share this in my, my, my first book, is that, you know, my, my first marriage did not work. It didn't. I ain't got nothing to hide with y'all. And I had completely given up on it. But God brought some people in my life when I met Lisa that showed me how to do it. That showed me, okay, here's what you got to understand, that this is what men can't do, but this is what men need to do. And because I was willing to listen to somebody else about how my life needs to be a little bit better, I was able to do a little bit better the second time around. Are y'all hearing me? So I need somebody in my life. So my question is, it's good to have friends, but who do you have that speaks into your life? So a man of too many friends comes to ruin, but there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. It's good to have people that encourage you, amen? You need those kind of friends, friends that stick closer than a brother. But then faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. That many times it's not what I want to hear, sometimes it's what I need to hear. And so Robert really needed somebody in his life to say, look, man, I know you have this idea. I know you want to make a billion dollars, but you are neglecting your wife. You're going to have to figure out a way to spend some time with her and then spend some time on your project. You need somebody to speak into your life. Look, sister girl, Melinda, you have an anger problem. You got an anger problem. And many times we look at men and we know men struggle with anger, but a lot of sisters, you need to be honest, you struggle with anger too. 
Amen. Throwing stuff. Swing. Wait, he's supposed to take it. You don't have a right to put your hands on a man. It's never right. And many times we got anger issues as well, and we need to sit down and work through that stuff. We need God to cast out some of this stuff in us. Amen. And so I need somebody to challenge me to, so that I can hear what I need to hear. Oil and perfume make the heart glad, so a man's counsel is sweet to his friend. I need an advisor in my life. Every couple ought to have an advisor. Lisa and I have had advisors. In, we still do. Advisors in our life. Single people, you need an advisor, someone who speaks into your life to encourage you, to, to build you up, to give you wisdom, but also to help you stay on the path of what is right. And in relationships, y'all, here's where God really helps us, and I think this is where mentors help us. It's in the area of commitment. God is working on our commitment. And, and hear me, hear me very clearly. I, I, I clearly understand sometimes divorce happens and God forgives. I want to be very clear on that. God forgives, God cleanses. The problem is sometimes when we get divorced, we have to ask ourselves the question, are we learning the lessons? You got to learn the lessons. Because the truth is every marriage requires some kind of adaptation. But then number two, I'm not talking about relationships where there's physical abuse. Some of y'all were in situations, you did the best thing. You had to get out. You had to save yourself and your kids. Amen. And that was the right thing to do. But at the same time, sometimes God is working on our commitment. Because now we live in a day where it's okay to step away. Quickly. If, if they burnt the toast, that's grounds for divorce. I'm done with you. You burnt my toast for the first time. What? And we step away quickly. We leave jobs too quickly. We leave churches too quickly. And we don't understand that sometimes God wants us to work through some stuff. It's working through it that I gain character. It's getting dirty with it that I learn how to be strong. And so people ask now, that Lisa and I have been married 30 years. Uh, you know, this month I've been asked a number of times, man, how did y'all do it? 30 years, it must be wonderful. I said, no, it has not always been wonderful. There are times Lisa really struggled with me, and there were times I really struggled with her. And I said this at the first service when she was here, so y'all don't be looking at me. I wonder if he said it. I did say it at the first service. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, he said it at the first service. <laughs> there were times she screamed at me, and I screamed at her. There were times she packed, and I packed. There were times she left, and I left. There were times we both went to counseling. There were times she went to counseling. There were times I went to counseling. And in all that, you know what God was teaching us? It's more than a feeling. You got to stay with it. You got to go back. You got to trust me. And as we stayed with it, watch this, we got stronger. And what God is saying to some of us, wherever you are, if you are married, listen, you got to stay with that thing. Sometimes you ain't going to have the same feeling you had on the honeymoon. But that's not real to think that 30 years of marriage is a honeymoon. We say that. That ain't real. That ain't real. See, y'all, see, y'all, that ain't real. Tell your neighbor, unrealistic. You're going to have some wars. You're going to have some battles. Come on now. And you work through it. And when you work through it, that's where God shows up. And he reminds you, listen, if I stay with you in all your issues, why are you complaining about them? And the moment you start complaining about it, that's how you know God is speaking to you. Well, what about your issues? And so I'm going to use this illustration. I'm going to use it again. I, I used it uh, at, at the first service. It's, it's the, the women of the church, about 20 women are going to Ghana on a mission trip. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. That's really wonderful. That's really exciting. And so they're going to Ghana, and I've been to Ghana, and I asked Lisa, who's giving leadership to it, I said, well, uh, have they, have they, um, uh, are they going to go to El Minya? El Minya is one of the castles where most of the slaves that came to America went through in Ghana. And Lisa said, oh, yeah, we got to stop by there. Well, I've been to that castle, and if you've ever been to the castle, it, it, it'll just blow your mind because it's a huge fort in which they held the slaves before they would take them on the ship. And if you go into the, into the, uh, the lower portions where they held the slaves, you can still see the lower line levels of where all the feces, the feces was like about this high. 
and you can see the stain on the wall from all the feces. It's, it literally has stained and how uh, slaves were hoarded into these places like, like cattle and stacked in 50, 100 without even moving. And what's a trip above, above the castle, right above where they had these holding places, or these holding tanks for the slaves was a chapel. Beautifully made out, manicured, uh, nice wooden floor. You can see the pews where people sat. You can see the, the place where the preacher preached. And, and I couldn't help but think at the, at the time when I was there, I said, Lord, this, this is a contradiction for me. This is a contradiction for me. Because how can you sing praises to God upstairs and you don't hear the shrieks and the cries of women and children and men down below. I said, it's a bunch of crock. That ain't, that ain't the Christianity that I know. I'm like Frederick Douglass. That's that slave-holding Christianity. I said, Lord, how is it that Christianity can have that contradiction? I never shall forget what he said. He said, isn't it amazing that people can see the contradictions in others before they see the contradiction in themselves? And in that moment, I began to bow down before him and thank him for his greatness that in spite of all the things that has happened to people in general and my people, that God has still kept us. But I got to deal with the contradictions in my own life. So number one, number one, here it is, magical lies. Number two, misunderstood loneliness. I, I, I need some people in my life. I need those individuals that can speak to it. Number three, don't forget that the whole issue of love is the master's love. Love has everything to do with it because the whole issue of love is the master's love. And if you look in this text, I'm going to read it again. It says, my people have committed two sins. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. And, and God here, he's, he's making an issue of his relationship with his people. He said the issue is the reason why your relationships are not working because you give more love to people than you do to me. And that's why they don't satisfy. And matter of fact, if you go back and read all of chapter 2, it's really almost like God is in divorce court. He's ready to divorce his people. And, 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 he, and it's like, okay, God, you can't do that. That's kind of the sense of it. You, you're the one that broke the laws. How can you break your own laws? He says it ain't got nothing to do with ritual. It has nothing to do with religion. It has everything to do with love. They have broken my heart. And so there's this spirit there that they give so much love. And that's what you really see in Melinda's character. She gives so much love to a man. And then Robert, he gives so much love to his idea. And many times it's a misplaced love. And the only thing that's going to make it work, y'all, is the master's love for us. That in our brokenness, does anybody know God will love you? Does anybody know nobody will love you like the Lord? Does anybody know nobody will keep you like the Lord? And so in this text in chapter 2, it's in the brokenness that they learn that God loves them. And so God lets them go into exile by the Babylonians. And that's what Jeremiah does. He preaches uh, these series of sermons. That, Look, the Babylonians are going to carry you into exile. And that's exactly what they do. And it's in exile that they rediscover their love for God. It's in their trouble <laughs> that they find out that God is the one that loved them like nobody else. You know, sometimes you got to get away <laughs> to know how good God is. Sometimes God has to remove you to remind you of how God is. Is there anybody not uh, ashamed to admit that I've been away from God? I've had some difficulties, but it was in those times that God spoke to my heart. He reminded me of his anointing. He reminded me of his goodness and his presence, and that's what God will do. He'll shower his love on us. He'll bless us in a distant place. And that's what God did, and that began the breaking in their hearts. That began the bolding of their lives, and they began to turn their affection to God. And it raises one principle about God's love and his presence, that many times it takes deep breaking before there's a real releasing. Uh, they used to tell us as young preachers that if God's going to use you greatly, first he has to break you deeply. And many times when it comes to really loving God the way God wants us to be loved, sometimes 
sometimes I got to go through some heartache. Sometimes I got to go through some trouble. I, I grew up in church and I know all the songs and I know all the words and, and I know what God can do. But if I can testify, it's when my heart was broken. It's when I got in some trouble, when I was in some difficulty. That's when the Lord met me. And that's what God will do for you in your brokenness. That's when you learn to praise him. In your brokenness, that's when you learn to pray. And that's when you learn to lean on God. And God will be your strength. And then you'll know what real love is. And you'll know what love belongs to God and what love belongs to people because you know what the Lord has done for you. And so like the old folk, I'll say it, if it had not been for the Lord <laughs> on my side, is there anybody that can testify? The only reason why you're here now because God was watching over you. God had his hand on your life. That's my word to you today. Love has everything to do with it. And the good news is, church, is this. God will use your worst pain to birth in you a love and a purity for him that not only will help you see him clearly, but also see your relationships with the people you love in the right way. He'll do it for you because he loves us that much. Father, we bless you and thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence. And I sense your presence in this place, Lord, today. Because the truth is, Lord, it's easy to try on a love that is human-oriented, that doesn't work. And yet I hear your mercy. I sense your grace in this place, Lord, to reorient our hearts to you. That even in those broken places where we've left you for somebody else, you'll meet us and reignite a love for you. I, I, I pray that right now in this house. I, I believe you're doing that. Somebody's been disappointed by somebody. Somebody's been betrayed, knows something about infidelity. Somebody, Lord, knows something even about fleeing abuse. But if somebody, Lord, is here, tried their best, it just didn't work. Oh, God, would you heal the broken places in our heart? Would you meet us? And, and don't just heal them. But Lord, turn them to you. Give us a love that's pure from heaven. Give us a love for you. That in the midst of it, we came out not only with better relationships, but a better walk with you. We learn to love you, live for you, and be committed to you. Because you're that good. We thank you, and we love you. In Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen.